for Lafort. Let's go here. Let's go up. There we go. The 11th webinar for Lafort this year, and I'm in fact the only, I'm the ninth presenter. We've been working through a bunch of people with, within the company. Um, we have an extensive research and development department back in France, and we have a whole bunch of specialists in individual fields. So we've had uh, our rosé specialist do rosé. We've had our sparkling wine specialist do two webinars on sparkling wine. Uh, and then there's more coming up. We have two more this month, one on enzymes and one on tannins. Uh, and then three next month, we, we get into protocols, making red wines, making white wines, and malolactic fermentation. And then, of course, at the end of August, we'll stop doing webinars because you won't watch them anyway because it's the middle of harvest. Okay, so this one, yeast, uh, back to basics, and, and a little bit about new strains. Um, this presentation, we actually prepared this for our internal staff just to remind us all of the, the kind of the key facts about yeasts. Um, and it was probably the best received presentation we did this year. So let's launch into it. Okay, oh, I should tell you before I do that. So the people, the authors of this presentation, uh, Joanna Coulon is our head of microbiology for the research and development department. Uh, Philippe Marulo is a, he's a Lafort staff member. He's a PhD, he works at the University of Bordeaux. And if you do a PhD on uh, anything to do with yeast breeding, Philippe Marulo will be one of your supervisors. Margot Bernard also works at Bordeaux University as does Chantal Mansour. Uh, Virginie Moine is the head of our research and development department in Bordeaux. And of course me, I'm the general manager of Lafort USA. And in the beginning, there was Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, so Saccharomyces is, it, it is evolved uh, like, like many other things. Uh, it's really only found, I think, about 9,000 years BC is about the oldest uh, record of a Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Now, it's associated with numerous fer fermented products. I mean, we're talking bread, beer, spirits. Um, but it's not often found in non-human environments. So you could, you could consider it like a, a domesticated species. Uh, DNA was found in uh, King Scorpion's tomb jars in Egypt in 3200 BC. Um, there was fermentation activity found in Neolithic potteries, six to 7,000 BC. That's in China. China's kind of important here because it's, I think it, we believe it actually came from China. And nowadays, of course, it's found in cellars, it's found on grape berries, it's sort of spread out throughout the world. So where does it come from? Now, this big mess of a kind of spidery tree thing here, uh, it's how all of the species of sac all of the strains strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae are related. Uh, it's too much information to really portray neatly, but there are basically families of Saccharomyces cerevisiae which are related. Uh, so you can see on the, the right hand side of your screen that CHN1, CHN2, they're, they're China ones. They're, they're isolated from uh, from uh, basically from primeval forests. Uh, and then on the, the left-hand side, you can see some families. There's some more Chinese families. There's the Saki family. There's a North American family. Um, and then on the very left-hand side in the middle, actually, you know what? I can use this cool thing here, which is called a laser pointer, which is actually something else. Here we go. Wine, European. These are the strains that we're really interested in. Okay. But then there's more. There's Malaysian, West African, more from China. But basically, we're looking at... Uh, these isolates came from primeval forests, secondary forests, um, and then there's more isolates which are wild, they come from fermentation, and they've moved into fermentation, clinical uses, baking, and laboratory. Now, this, uh, this little um, uh, this study is by Wang et al. in 2012. If you really want to dig into this, uh, you can Google Wang, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae history, and there's a recent article that was published in Nature magazine, which is on, online. This is, the, this is the geek out part of the presentation. Okay, let's go next. We are looking at the origins. Now, Saccharomyces cerevisiae can't move by itself. Uh, it has to be transported by insects. That's basically how it's spread around the globe. 
Uh, it's moved from China throughout uh, through Egypt and into Europe. Um, so over the years, it's been selected and domesticated with more and more precise, well, I wouldn't say enological criteria, I would say fermentation criteria. It depends on you know, what medium is being, is being fermented. So the aim of this presentation, we're going to look at some of you know, the five parameters that are often talked about, about classifying Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So one is the killer factor. We get inquiries every now and again about you know, which, which yeast are killer factors. Uh, the next is the ability to produce vinyl phenols. Uh, resulting SO2, that's whether the, the, the Saccharomyces produces or consumes total sulfur dioxide during fermentation. Demand for nitrogen. And it's affinity for fructose. And that's, that kind of ties into the stuck fermentation concept. Okay, let's go. First, taxonomic reminder. Saccharomyces bayanus. This is, uh, and I admit, I really enjoyed this presentation when I first saw it because I had always wondered, what's bayanus? Why is it different? So in fact, um, back in the 1970s, it was, uh, it was Pino uh, who classified the yeast according to what they did. Right? So Saccharomyces cerevisiae was considered the yeast that would ferment galactose. And Saccharomyces bayanus was the yeast that would not ferment galactose. Of course, there's a whole bunch of other phenotypical criteria, and that's how we used to classify yeast. Um, now, Saccharomyces bayanus still exists, but it's actually a different species. Um, now, when we look at yeasts, we classify them genetically. So bayanus is there, you can see it. Let's go back to the cool little pointer. There's bayanus. It's here, blah, 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 blah. Um, and this is the genetic, this is the family tree of Saccharomyces. And Saccharomyces cerevisiae is a different species entirely. But you'll often see references to bayanus, okay? The term, this term still exists. And in fact, we have a yeast BO213, which uh, we put in parenthesis, you know, X Saccharomyces bayanus, because that's what a lot of people think about that one. So bayanus, it's, Everything is Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Yeah, that's the first kind of the first take-home point. Bayanus is an old term which is not used nowadays. Why were they there in the first place? Well, it was, oh god, it was, it was even prior to that. It was uh, 1953. Pano and de Merck, they described this galactose-negative strain group. They were often found at the end of alcoholic fermentation. And they were described as having better fermentative abilities. And that's why we think of Bayanus as being the, the restart fermented. Um, it was in the 1990s, though, that uh, these galactose negative strains were found not to be dominant in spontaneous fermentations. And we really sort of dug into the fact that strain is more important than species. So the strain of Saccharomyces cerevisiae is what makes it a strong fermenter rather than whether it ferments galactose or not. But still, this, this uh, classification still exists and you know, we still associate the term with you know, better fermentation yeast. But there's lots more criteria which are actually way more important than uh, this, this Bayanus thing. So here's the, here's the five that we're going to cover, okay? Uh, so we're going to start off with number one. Good place to start. The killer character. Lots of Killer character is one of those things that people talk about, kind of like Bayanus, and you know, it's nice to have a little bit of knowledge here. Okay, so some basically the yeast strains contain these, these virus-like particles, the non-infectious microvirus. And what this virus, this VLP, does is it can produce a toxin, K, and or produce an immunity factor, R. Okay. This is just like part of the genetic makeup of the yeast. This is just what they do. Um, so a killer strain is a strain that produces the toxin, K. Well, actually, there's three. There's three, actually. There's K1, K2, and K28. Um, so a killer strain will produce the toxin and will also produce the immunity factor. So in theory, it could kill everything but not be killed itself. That's, uh, that's this guy over here, right? The killer strain. Now... A neutral strain, this guy over here on the right-hand side, doesn't have the killer factor, 
but it does have the immunity factor. So it can just sort of exist in, in the medium and just do its thing. This guy here, you can't see it because it's got a skull and crossbones. That's the sensitive strain. It's got no killer factor and it's got no immunity. So in theory, this guy is gonna take out this guy. A uh, little side note on the, 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 different, the three different uh, toxins, K1, K2, and, 20, and K28. K2 is the most abundant, basically due to its, uh, its pH, uh, its pH uh, parameters. K1 um, only is active at pH 4.2 and above. Well, maybe there's some wines at 4.2 that are made, but that's less common. All right, the killer factor. Let's go forward here. It's pretty easy to figure out the killer factor. You basically use an antibody, you put a drop of it onto the uh, cell layer, figure out is the strain a killer. Um, you put a drop on it, it'll look like this if it's a killer, and it'll look like that if it's uh, not a killer. Pretty easy to do. You can also test for a strain that's neutral or sensitive. Oh, here we go here. So you can first you test for a sensitive for its killer factor, then you test whether it's neutral or sensitive. Um, and it's basically you're looking at the uh, this presence here, the killer strain. You add a drop of the killer strain, and you look at the cell layer and what happens to it. It's a pretty easy test. We've done it. We've done it on all of our yeast. Uh, but what does it mean? Uh, and why don't we publish this data as to what it is? So here's some, here's some, this is actually a set of fermentations from 1994 through 1998. Um, and I, I apologize, there's a few slides in this presentation where there's a lot of numbers. So I'll sort of walk you through. So this, um, this study was revisited in 2011. Uh, okay, this was published in 2011. And what we're looking at is, in each of these vintages, so we've got 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, um, there are a bunch of fermentations. You see it looks like 12 in 1994, 10 in 95, 6 in 96, et cetera. And they tested the types of strains, whether they be killer, neutral, or sensitive, in the fermentation at three points. So VF is vigorous fermentation, EF is at the end, and AF is the average fermentation. So we'll look first at 1994. In, uh, in 1994, they didn't test in early fermentation, at the end of fermentation, okay? So in 1994, this particular winery, there were 12 fermentations, 64% had killer yeasts during vigorous fermentation, and 64% for the average fermentation, okay? And 36 were neutral. So you would think that, you know, this is a native winery, okay? You would think that the killer are gonna dominate um, the, the, the microflora of the cellar, and that's it. They're, gonna, they're, they're there to stay. Weird thing is, though, in 1995, it's uh, changed quite a bit. Um, 1995, uh, let's look at just vigorous fermentation here. In the middle of fermentation, almost 60% were sensitive, and only 15% were killer. So it's like, well, the killer aren't really doing a good job. 1996, vigorous fermentation, they were mainly neutral. 83% with 17% as, uh, as killer. 1997, similar story. Uh, 1998, 1998 uh, looks like pretty much 84 to 87% of all of the yeast detected in these fermentations were sensitive strains, and the killer strains were very minor. So basically what's, what's happening is that the killer factor is not a key issue in winemaking. Now, you know, you feel free to send us an email and we'll tell you which yeast are killer and which aren't, but they're not, it's not really a critical factor. Part of it is the pH, and the other part is the phenolic interactions. Okay, mainly reds, but it's, it's, it's basically, it's just not a, not a big factor. Which is good, because there's plenty of other factors that are important. So next one, so first up, killer factor, good there. Next one is the ability to produce vinyl phenol. Okay, so vinyl phenols. Vinyl phenols are those things that smell like vinyl. Um, I had the unfortunate experience. I bought a bottle of wine. Um, the producer shall remain nameless. I bought a bottle of wine last year. It was a Sauvignon Blanc. It was from, it was a couple of years old. It was like a 2015 Sauvignon Blanc. I was like, oh, I'm kind of curious. Let's give it a try. 
pop the cork, uh, and it just smelled like a swimming pool. And it was the first time I'd really experienced, oh, that's, that's vinyl phenols. That's, that's what they smell like. Anyway, so um, basically Saccharomyces cerevisiae either do or don't produce vinyl phenols. It's another kind of on-off switch. And it's, it's genetically based. It's the PAD1 gene, phenylacryl acid decarboxylase. There's two forms of that. So there's PAD1 when the enzyme is functional. And there's PAD1 asterisk, which is when they're, it's actually mutated and they're non-functional. They're the POF negative, right? They can't produce vinyl phenols. Uh, we actually have a patent on it. This thing here, Brevet the Invention is, uh, my French accent is not perfect. Um, is a patent. This is by Philippe Marullo, actually, uh, the guy we, uh, our guy at the University of Bordeaux. He actually, this patent has three, three uh, genetic tests on it for describing different ways to categorize yeast. And this part of what Lafort do is we have, um, let me see, we've sponsored about 18 PhDs and we have a whole bunch of patents that we've developed, you know, basically for developing tools to make better wine. All right, so this is the POF, POF, phenolic off flavor character. We can look at some numbers here. So the detection threshold is around 725 micrograms per liter. So four vinyl phenol and four uh, vinyl glycol. These are similar. These can evolve with Britannomyces into uh, ethyl phenols and ethyl glycol, 4EB, 4EG. Um, so if you concentrations, you know, maximum found, you know, it's a bigger issue in whites. And I certainly found it in the Sauvignon Blanc I tasted. Um, and thus the, the phenolic off flavor, positive and negative strains are more important for whites than for reds. And there's some degree of inhibition by phenolic compounds to this as well. So we have, we have some, we have some uh, POF negative strains, uh, VL1, VL2, X16, et cetera, um, and active polarization. And the remainder are actually off positive. They have the ability to produce vinyl phenols. So you have to manage your fermentation a little differently. Mainly with the use of enzymes. Use purified enzymes. That's a longer story. I'm not going to go into that. I'll bring it up actually next week. I'm doing a presentation on enzymes. So if you're interested in the way enzymes work with uh, vinyl phenols, that'll be part of it. Okay. Vinyl phenols. Uh, resulting SO2. This is... Uh, this is the uh, production or consumption of total SO2 during fermentation. So <clears throat> we're going to look at what happens here. There's a bunch of, here we have another table with lots of numbers on it. Let's use this little point here. So we have five wines we're looking at here. And this is the total SO2 in the must itself. Okay, excuse me, I'm just going to get a glass of water. Okay. <clears throat> Total SO2 in the must first, is this one here. Then we have, so this, this is a 34 different yeast strain test. There's, they're all tested in triplicate. Uh, this is a published article. Minimum at the end of fermentation, you've got three where the SO2 went up, all right? This one, two, and this Sauvignon Blanc here. And you got two where the SO2 went down, all right? So okay. consumption. Then the maximum at the end of fermentation, they all went up. So that's the maximum. And look at, the, look at the variety here. It's huge, the difference here within these individual wines with 34 different yeast strains. So yeast strains have a very wide range of abilities to produce and consume total SO2. So the result, what we call the resulting SO2, it's actually it's the, the, balance, it's the balance of the SO2, is basically what's in the must plus the yeast production minus the yeast consumption. And it varies according to the strain itself. And I'm not going to delve into this slide very much at all. Um, biochemistry is a fascinating field. We don't have three hours to explain this, but basically there's a, a variety of places that it can be produced from, from must sulfates, from other precursors, uh, and also it can be consumed by cysteine and methionine metabolism via H2S. Um, if you want to dig into that, that's, that's a fun topic, but I was just going to say that's how it works. Because um, I'm more interested in what does it mean to me as a winemaker, right? So we have basically, it's about 50-50 in terms of 
strains whether they produce or consume SO2. So the consumer strains, we have VL1, XPUR, F33, and we have producer strains, CH9, F83, roughly 50-50, okay? So, but some, a lot of these strains, and this applies to all yeast strains out there, there's probably maybe 250, 300 potential yeast strains in the marketplace. Um, so what can you do to avoid a high total SO2? If you have less total SO2 up front, that helps, okay? Um, it's not direct, it's, it's correlated, okay? Uh, you can live, limit the level of sulfates in mass, that's a little higher, uh, but diammonium sulfate, think about that, that's one part of sulfate. Uh, now let's have a look here at this, uh, this, this table, we're looking, we're comparing two yeasts. CH9 is a SO2 producer. Actually, at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna talk about CH9. Um, and uh, VL1 is not a producer. Okay, so here we have a couple of four, situ four situations. The initial total SO2 of 30 milligrams per liter. Right? CH9 increased the total SO2 by 39. VL1 increased it by three. All right, so there's a, there's a very small increase in VL1 and a very large increase in CH9. The initial total SO2 of 70, CH9 increased it by even more. Enzyme for VL1, Increase it by the same, 3 ppm. Okay, so that's so it, it depends a little bit depending on the yeast on your initial SO2 levels. So the one in the one in parentheses, that's another, that's another piece of the puzzle. We call this CL35. Now CL35 is a it's, it's an arbitrary measure. You know, we basically made it up. Um, it measures the amount of SO2 that you have to add to get 35 milligrams per liter free. Right? So what it does is it tells you, it indicates how many binding compounds there are. So let me think, you've got pyruvate, you've got acid aldehyde, you've got oxoglutaric acid. They're the three big compounds that are produced by, by Saccharomyces cerevisiae during fermentation that bind SO2. So the higher your CL35 number means that there are more binding compounds in there. Okay, now it also seems that there's an impact of, of the amount of SO2 in the must with the amount of binding compounds that are produced. So if we look here, again, let's just look at the numbers in parenthesis here, right? So with our CH9, 150 was required total to get this, bind, this, this uh, free SO2 after fermentation. But with a higher level of initial SO2, you needed even more SO2 to get your 35 parts free. So with the higher SO2, not only do you, are you, is the yeast producing more SO2, it's producing more binding compounds. And actually the same applies to the VL1. Even though it's producing the same three milligrams per liter as production by the yeast, this increase from 100 to 141 is the increase in the production of the binding compounds because of this increased SO2 level here. So something to bear in mind, the more SO2 you add up front, the more SO2 you're going to have to add down the down the track as you as you as you age your wine. Next slide. Okay, SO2 SO2 balance, you know, the resulting SO2. So what about um? I, I mean, like I said, this is this is really just a these are the basics of how of how yeast work. You know, these are the factors that we often think about. And here's some here's some actual data. So yen nitrogen demand. How do, we, how do we measure that? So there's, uh, there's two steps in fermentation, right? You've got, oh here, let's try this pencil tool. Let me see if this works. No, that's not it. Sorry, I'm just you know, gonna use the pencil. Two steps in fermentation. The first step here, okay? That is your biomass production, right? And then the second step, what do we got here? We've got this section here. This is the fermentation, right? So during the production of biomass, your uh, yeast cell counts go up and up and up. Over here, let's get the pointer back. Go up and up and up. And your, well, there's your fermentation activity bam, down there, as measured by the amount of CO2 produced per 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 mil, right? We've got two lines here for biomass, right? 
This top one here is a high yen demanding strain. And this bottom one here is a low yen demanding strain. So basically where, where it needs this extra yen is this, this biomass production stage. A high yen demanding strain produces a whole lot of biomass. That's, that's, where the, that's where the nitrogen is needed to produce biomass. And then it plateaus, and they both behave pretty similarly on the, on the plateau there. See what this goes here. Yeah. Um, so what we do during fermentation is we have to divide up our addition of nitrogen into two pieces. The first being that nitrogen to allow the biomass to be produced. And then the second is the maintenance part where you want to keep the biomass that's there fermenting. And if you add the risk here is if you add too much nitrogen at the start, what you'll do is you'll actually induce even more biomass production. And then you'll induce a, a problem at the end of fermentation because there's so much biomass, there's so many yeast cells that they end up consuming all the nitrogen and just dying and you have a stuck room. That's why you should read the, read the instructions. You know? This is why we have yan, different yam levels. So how do we measure it? It's pretty easy. We basically put, it's, it's the opposite of sugar consumption actually. We look at um, the actual fermentation. Uh, and the way we measure fermentation is actually we put it on a scale and we measure the evolution of carbon dioxide. Basically, just you know, sugar ferments into alcohol, which it produces CO2, and the CO2 evaporates, and then your, your weight goes down. Right? So, what we do is we add nitrogen, basically ammonia, to keep a constant um, fermentation rate. Okay? And that tells us whether we have a weak, a low, or a medium, or a high uh, yen in the, in the, in the, for that specific yeast. Pretty simple test. So you can bet you keep that in mind when you're looking at yeast charts. Um, if it says low, medium, or high yen demand, keep that in mind. And you want to add that proportionally to follow the instructions on the yeast nutrient addition. Okay, that was yen. So we've covered the killer character, we've covered the vinyl phenol production, we've covered SO2 production, we've looked at yen. We're going to look at uh, Fructose, fructophilia, that's what it is. So grape must is basically 50-50, glucose and fructose. It's pretty much sucrose, right? Stuck wine, by contrast, has a whole lot less glucose and a whole lot more fructose. And if you've ever looked at, uh, uh, the, you get your, uh, your enzymatic analysis done at the end of fermentation on your stuck wine, there's, there's more fructose. And Saccharomyces cerevisiae definitely metabolizes glucose more easily than fructose. Uh, but there's causation and there's correlation. So the higher fructose concentration in the stuck wine is a consequence of the stuck wine and not the cause of the stuck fermentation. All right. The grapes didn't start out with too much fructose. They just ended up with more fructose because the because of the stress conditions in the fermentation. Now that, that's, that's important. Um, so what happens is with the sugar is that there's a, there's a transporter, HXT3P, right? Um, basically we've looked at all of the genetic gene coding in uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Yeah. So this transport, br transporter brings the glucose or the fructose into the cell, right? Now, HXT3P has a higher affinity for glucose than for fructose, right? But the presence of ethanol increases the osmotic stress on the cell, um, and it makes the fructofuranose form, the fructose, more difficult to transport into the cell. So, you know, it makes sense. Higher alcohols makes it more easy to get stuck fermentations. So this gene, HXT3P, right? Um, there's two different ones, okay? There's the regular one, and then there's the asterisk one, kind of like that uh, the, the pad pad one uh, and the pad one star, right? So you got a stuck alcoholic fermentation, you have double trouble for Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Yeah. You have high ethanol, you have the glucose to fructose ratio less than one. 
So you really need a, a, a strain with a higher fructose affinity. Now this HXTP, HXT3 star allele in the genetic coding actually has a better transporter um, for bringing fructose into the cell, right? And then, so if you're looking at the genotypes, you've got, uh, there's a few yeast here, BO213, Spark. So BO213 is, is uh, interestingly, we put in parenthesis X bayanus, so you know, we can remind ourselves, oh yeah, that's, that's the one that ferments, it's a strong fermenter. Um, it has two of these alleles, right? So we haven't proven it yet, we don't know, but we think it's better, right? Now, Zyma for Spark, interestingly, that's, that yeast is used, it's approved by the, the CIBC, the Committee International Vins de Champagne, um, for production of, of champagne, all right, for the secondary fermentation. That actually has only one of those HXT3 star alleles. Uh, VL1, by contrast, has none of the stars. And VL1 is not a super strong yeast. I mean, VL1 is not going to get you to 16% alcohol. Right? It'll get you to 14, no problem at all. 14 is a bit, no problem, but not 16. Uh, you've affirmed 43, uh, that's somebody else's yeast. I think I've heard of that. Um, that we know for sure has one of the HXT3 star alleles, but we don't know if it's got two. We haven't studied that far into it. All right. So, so basically, there's a bit of an association here with what was called the Bayana strains and the strains that actually have this HXT3 star allele in them. All right. But it's not. It's not. But it's not guaranteed. It's not all the time. But there's a there's a there's a strong correlation. So that, that's the bit that's important, that allele that, that helps transport fructose into the cell and allows the, the yeast to ferment. Oops, jumped a few slides. Let's go back one. Um, oh, there we go. So there's some nice pretty diagrams of fermentation. These are these are the way we uh we, we plot fermentations. We actually plot the amount of CO2 release so that they go up instead of down. All right, so what have we done here? Uh, conclusions. Really, we've got a set of standardized tests to compare yeast strains you know, for, for, for actually important enological criteria. The killer character, we're gonna throw that one out, it's not that critical. Ability to produce vinyl phenols can be critical. It's definitely worth thinking about. SO2 production, definitely an issue. And we're gonna talk a lot about that in the next part of the presentation, which is the new strains uh, part of the presentation. Uh, yen demand. Um, Nitrogen, how we measure that, and the affinity for fructose. So if we look at the killer factor, stop here, not very relevant. Um, it's not formally, formally, not formally, not formally demonstrated in condition, in, in logical conditions. Uh, the phenolic off flavor, positive or negative, we have a pattern on that. On, on, we have a pattern on how you can find this gene, right? Uh, and, and we can describe the yeast as being either way. Uh, yen demand, uh, it's linked to the biomass production ability. That's the key part. Um, and gives the importance of yen supplementation during the yeast stationary phase. So the second part of fermentation. And it kind of falls out of the camera. There we go. Okay. There's also, we looked at fructose affinity. Um, yeast like glucose, stuck ferments is more fructose than glucose because it's harder for yeast to bring fructose into the cell. And some, some certain yeast species have a sugar transporter that is better suited to bringing fructose into the cell. It's not linked to the former designation as Bayanus, but it, they're correlated. Um, and then SO2, resolving SO2 production and consumption. Many strains of consumers, it's actually about 50-50. Uh, Production of SO2 is linked to production of SO2 binding products. So we did, um, uh, we have a whole set of presentations that we did this year about uh, reducing SO2 in wine. And one of the ways to reduce SO2 in wine, because there's, there's definitely consumer pressure on reducing SO2. So one of the ways to reduce SO2 is to reduce the amount of binding products in, in, in the wine, because then you, you don't need to add as much SO2, right? So if you choose a yeast that is intentionally a consumer of SO2, you're gonna end up with less binding products 
at the end of fermentation, and you're going to end up with less of a need to add SO2 during the aging of the wine. That's a total digression onto another theme, but that's it's, that's part of that's part of yeast. Okay, switch gears a little bit. Not a little bit. We're still talking about yeast. We're talking about how this is more about how yeast are developed, how we get new yeasts. Right? We're going to look at one particular one, but it's more. You know, I'm, I'm more interested personally in the, the concept of how this how this works. Right? So yeast. Okay, so we've wrapped up the basics. If you've got any questions for the basics, you know, as I said, just uh, just jot it down, and we'll we'll get to the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, uh, now we're going to move into yeast breeding and uh, how we develop new strains. There's two ways to develop yeast new strains. One is you go out into a vineyard and you find them. That's getting harder and harder. They're still they're still out there. You know, you can basically go out and find a, a winery that has a consistent flavor profile that's using you know, you know, one yeast from their vineyard or whatever. And then you can genetically test it, figure out if it's a new species, and then you take it into other conditions to get the same characteristics coming. That's how we got our yeast CH9. Uh, it's from, it was from an organic vineyard in Burgundy. The wines were very distinctive. Um, my phone buzzing, I'll stop that. Uh, hang on a sec. Um, the wines were very distinctive. Um, this kind of hazelnutty character. And then we took that yeast, we isolated it, we genetically typed it, figured out, okay, it is unique. And then we went and put it into other Chardonnays to see if we got the same characteristics, and we did. So that was that's the first way of developing a yeast is you go out and find it. Right? But as you can imagine, it gets harder and harder as you know you find more and more yeast and they, they're all found, right? Another way you can develop yeast is uh, is breeding. Now, yeast breeding is you basically take a, a piece of one you want and a piece of another one you want and you stick them together, all right? This is the bit where yeast have sex. We're kind of are getting into the interesting section of the presentation. All right, so here we have, we start out here. Whoops, wrong button. Where's my pencil? Here. This is our yeast cells, okay? We have two ways of reproducing yeast cells. Go to the left, you have vegetative reproduction. That's when you have budding. So it's basically genetically the same material. You know, the yeast will produce a bud, the mother daughter, the daughter will pop out, and then that's it's the same cell. And that's how that's how fermentation happens. Now if you go to the right, this way, what you do is you stress the individual yeast cells. So these two here, they're they're actually different, different strains of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. You stress them and they can actually reproduce and you can combine the genetic material. So they basically they sporulate and the spores can, can make. Um, then you basically put the spores together into a what's called a micro manipulator uh, and you, you breed new strains. It's a very, very small hotel. There it is there, it's very small. So this this breeding section, section, this is this is an example of um, where we are. Uh, this is the four step breeding process here. We started at the top in the micro manipulator. We have this this strain here on the left, and we have this strain here on the right. There's two of them, right? We make them spirulate here. G1 spores, B4 spores. G1 is our first strain, and B4 is our second strain. And then we make them, we stick them together, and they produce hybrid one. This guy here. And then what we can do is we spirulate hybrid one. And we can back cross it with one of the parents. So if you've got something like CH9, which you know has this wonderful hazelnut character, I mean, insert yeast name here, it doesn't matter. If you have this yeast where you have this wonderful character, but it has a small problem, in this case, it produces a lot of total SO2. You go find a, a species, that, a, a strain that has zero production of SO2 or even consumes SO2, and you basically start mating these strains together and then back crossing because this first h1 is about 50 50 genetically of the two strains so it's going to not it's not probably not going to be what you want but then you back cross in the first cross it's got 75 percent so the second cross is 75 percent of the parent strain then you back cross again and you get 83 percent of the parent strain and you back cross again you get 93.25 percent of the parent strain so basically you keep crossing to get more and more of the parent strain the catch is that you're not exactly sure what genetic material you're transferring. So you have to, there's two ways. One is you, you do 
you ferment them basically and see what happens, right? You can do genetic testing, but you, you ferment them and see what happens. Um, which is which is what we do. Basically, put them under stress and ferment them, and we'll try this H1, we'll ferment it and see what does it do. Right? Then we'll try H2, we'll, what does it do? It's actually a little more complicated than that. All right. Where are we now? Okay, so do, 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 do. I'm going to get into a more complicated part of it in a bit. Um, so this directed breeding, this is what we call it, directed breeding. It's not GMO. You're not actually doing like CRISPR and cutting out genes and slicing them and making new ones. Um, it's basically classical breeding. You're just basically reproducing them by sporulation. Um, breeding, breeding itself is a little hit and miss. Right? Directed breeding is when you hybridize two strains, but then you back cross one of the parents to bring it closer and closer to the parent, right? to one parent. Right? So that's the directed breeding is you basically have, you, know, you want to have as much of the parent characteristic you want with just a small, unique genetic trait from the, the other donor. Oh, Chardonnay. This is where we're coming to. Chardonnay, right? Because we're talking about this yeast CH9, which which we thought, oh, it's great, has fantastic. Actually, the uh, little another side story here. The uh, what we were searching for was actually was actually not a yeast. We were looking for what the aromas were in Chardonnay. Chardonnay is one of those wines where it's like, well, I know what it tastes like, but can you describe a single aroma that's found in all Chardonnays? The answer is no. Right, but so we were trying to find out specific aroma molecules. And we did actually find, it took three PhDs, it took a little longer than we, we planned. Um, but uh, uh, Marina Gamakurta did this, uh, the thesis was, I think, two, three years ago, figured out the hazelnut aroma. The hazelnut aroma in Chardonnay is what we, we found. And we, we found this yeast along the way, which produced this hazelnut aroma. So that it felt like, okay, this is, this is great. Then we found out it produces a lot of SO2. It's like, okay, we have a great yeast, it's great aromas, but we have a, it's not perfect. So, and the reason we looked at Chardonnay is there's a lot of Chardonnay in the world, and the US is actually super important. The US produces about a quarter, roughly, of uh, the Chardonnay in the, in the world annually. Um, there's some uh, observed yields there from uh, Galle in 2015, which I think Mr. Galle has not been to the Central Valley in California and seen higher than five tons per acre. Uh, so I, I added that into my estimate of the, the gallons produced. Oops, read that slide, there we go. So we have CH9, we love it. Great aroma, great texture, can produce high total SO2. And, and remember, of course, if you're producing more SO2, you're also producing more binding compounds. Right? So it took us, a, all these things take a few years, honestly, to actually move from a one strain into a, another strain. Um, it was uh, Margot Bernard and Philippe Marullo, laboratory field tests. Uh, we basically brought in the, the gene of interest by successive back crossing. Right? And then after we genetically tested, then we had to take it into the field and do a whole bunch of fermentations and say, does this actually work? And this is, this is, this is the reality of, of hybridization, not quite as simple as you would like, right? So we're gonna start up here with uh, two specific strains, CH9 and at the, the, the SO2, the low SO2 producing strain. We hybridize them, but you know, they're actually, we got a whole bunch of them. There's a whole bunch of slightly different genetically, this is kind of like kids really. Um, they're different, yeah. And, uh, and then we back crossed it with, we picked one, right? That we found didn't produce SO2. So that gene had transferred during the hybridizing process into the new yeast. Then we back crossed again with CH9. And then we had to search again and make sure that A, we got the hazelnut aroma that we were looking for, made it uniquely Chardonnay. Um, and two, that it didn't produce SO2. Then we had to back cross again and again. And we ended up with this guy here, H4.3, which is CX9. Um, so basically, we had CH9, we called it CX9. If you're looking at the Fort Yeast, you know, if you ever wondered, the X series are the crossbred strains, and the just the letters are the, the terroir selection. Um, oops, here we go. Ah, then of course, it's all very nice to do this genetically, then you've got to go out in the field and make sure it does work, right? Uh, so we had to check it with different levels of uh, SO2 and different 
alcohol volumes. So this one here, we're looking at alcohol volumes. We did a Chardonnay, lower alcohol, and a Semillon at 16% alcohol. Um, different levels of total SO2. Made sure it worked. And then went in and said, let's look at volatile acidity. Same wines, the Chardonnay and the, the, um, the Semillon. Um, looked at the production of volatile acidity and the different fermentation conditions, different SO2 levels. We like that. Produce very low VA. Because uh, these, these are other pieces of the genetic puzzle. You know, yeast can produce a lot of VA. Uh, we then went in and said, okay, let's look at this SO2 production. And let's put another slide in the presentation, which has got lots of stuff in it. Um, so the, the key part of this, this table, I'm just going to describe it very briefly, is that basically, regardless of the initial SO2 uh, levels, C, we found that CX9 produces a lot less SO2 than CH9 did. That, that's the summary of that. Let's keep that easy. Because um, I just looked at my clock and I've gone way longer than I thought I would. Um, so we did a bunch of uh, more tests. Uh, Italy, Languedoc, uh, Mercury and Burgundy, some Graf Semillon. Looked at the binding compounds as well and the binding compounds decreased as measured by our, our CL35 measurement. Uh, and then let's look at where it fits now on the spectrum of production. Actually, I'm, I think I've only got a couple more slides left. I'm almost there. Um, so CH9 was way over there. Sorry, looking at my camera. Way, way over on one side, way over to the right of the, uh, of the spectrum. It, produced, it was in the top 10% of SO2 producing strains. And what we've done with CX9 is brought it back closer towards neutral. I mean, it produces a, a couple of parts of SO2 now. Um, and it fits in the spectrum of what's what's acceptable enologically. Um, if you want if you want an SO2 producer, EC1118, it's fantastic. It produces lots of total SO2. Um, it changed though. It wasn't just we couldn't just do one little gene slice. That'd be GMO, and that's not nobody does that. Not in not in the wine industry. Um, so this breeding we got a lot of the way there. CX9 is actually a better fermenter, stronger. It has the same short lag phase, same temperature range, same alcohol tolerance, much lower SO2 production. A couple other positives. It uh, has low nitrogen needs instead of moderate, and it does not produce phenolic off flavors. So we're actually super happy with this, uh, this crossbreeding technique. So I got it. I think I'm at the last side or the second last slide, but this is a blah blah blah. This is the, the, the you know, this is what the, the thing does, right? But the big question I had that we all had is, does it taste different? Because really, that's that's why we're trying to use these yeast is to get certain flavor profiles. Now, it does and it doesn't. It's got the same family of aromas, so it's got the hazelnut, it's got the uh, the almonds, it's got the toasted bread, um, but there's a switch in the flavor profiles and just the way that wines express themselves. You know, CX9 is a little more, I want to say, like fresh hazelnutty, and then CH9 is a little more citrusy. You know, it depends on the wine, but there's definitely subtleties in, in differences. Um, hard to say, it's, I mean, honestly. It's hard to say which one is the best one, but they're they're fun to but they're both fun to play with. They both make really nice chardonnay. So I think we got the end. Yes, last slide. Um, thanks to all of these people who put together these uh, this research work, um, and then thanks to you all for attending. There's the website. You can go there. Uh, we have a whole bunch of locations where you can get Lafort stuff. Um, Sky McLennan is the host of the webinar. And if you have any questions, um, email her. She'll take care of it. Uh, and also, if you want to see the webinar again, if you really want to see me talking again, you're welcome to. Uh, or if you missed something, 
send us an email or just or you can you know you can scroll through it quickly to the section you want to see. Uh, now I'm just going to check to see if we've got any questions over here. Um, oh my goodness, there's no, that's not it. Uh, no questions, really. My God, that either means I did a fantastic job. Or something else. Um, okay, well, I'll give it a couple minutes. Um, any questions? Uh, do, 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 what else we got? What questions did I have myself when I looked at this? I don't know. I kind of walked away thinking like, oh, that's cool. There's some, there's some really interesting factors there. You know, these are the, the core factors of why you choose different yeasts um, after, because this is the important part, after you choose the yeast because of the flavor profile or the texture or the, you know, the, the winemaking impact you want it to have. Do you want a clean, neutral fermenter? Do you want to have something that hides green characters? Do you want to have something that, you know, have something that highlights the, uh, the grassy styles, like, um, like the New Zealand style of Sauvignon Blanc? Do you want something that highlights the grapefruit style styles? Um, there's, all, there's a bunch of different uh, criteria. And then when you're going through your yeast, I want these flavor profiles in my wine, which is the key. Um, then you can look at the other factors and see if this is why. Oh, actually, here I have a, I have a question. Um, can we co-inoculate with VO213 with other yeasts? For instance, F15 with VO213 or VO3 with VO213? Um, that's a really good question. Okay, because the answer is yes and no, right? Yes, you can for sure. Uh, and we have a couple of customers, some very large wineries actually, that do about, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but I'm thinking something like 80% of their yeast that they want the flavor profile for. So for example, VL3 for a Sauvignon Blanc, and about 20% of the BO213. Now the theory is solid, Basically, what it does is that your VO213 has got a very low cell count, so it takes a while to get going. Your VO3 has got a very high cell count. It gets going, it ferments, it gives you all of these nice uh, thiol aromas and texture and mouthfeel, et cetera. Um, and then the B, but the VO213 is there and it's going to consume any fructose, which is there at the end of the fermentation. Now, something to, so two things to bear in mind. One is the wineries that do it swear by it. And don't have ferment, stuck ferment problems. Okay, this is good. This means yes. However, there's one thing I would caution against, which is you're never exactly 100% sure of what's fermenting. And there's um, there's been a bunch of studies done on uh, co uh, inoculating yeasts, and even under virtually ident virtually identical conditions you can get different populations dominating and not dominating, and they can change through the fermentation. If you've ever done, I know ETS do a cool service where they they have a database of all of the yeast strains out there in the industry, and uh, you can send your wine in during fermentation. They'll say, okay, this has got this yeast, in it, or it's got this yeast, and this yeast, and this yeast, and it can change during the fermentation. So the risk with co-inoculating is that you may have, you're not exactly sure what's going to work. The bonus is that it does work. Okay. I leave, I leave that up to you. Uh, oh, there's another one on there. There's another question. How would CX9 perform in a red wine? I don't know. Um, would I personally try it as a wine, put my winemaking hat back on? Would I try it as a winemaker? Um, I'd be curious. I mean, the hazelnut character is interesting. That's what it really develops. Um, and that's, but that's a, that's a compound of precursors already in Chardonnay. So yes, you could try it. Uh, and the temperature range we really looked at, we, didn't, we don't really push the temperature range too much, but it does only go up to about 22 Celsius, which is what, uh, 75, I think, Fahrenheit. So it's not super high. Um, there's only one way to find out, and that's give it a shot. Um, do we know? We're not exactly sure right now, but we know we developed it specifically because of its ability to produce the Chardonnay aromas. That's not really an answer, but it's the best I can do. All right. A um, couple minutes left, but we're going to wrap it up right now.
thank you all for coming. Um, come back to the next webinars. We have quite a few more coming and uh, you'll get email notifications. Thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your days.